Welcome everyone to the webinar. This is Speed Reading Strategies for Textbooks. I'm Paul Novak, the founder of Iris Reading. I want to thank you all for coming out today to check out the webinar. We're going to co cover a number of strategies to help you read textbook type material. And when we're talking about textbook type material, obviously we're talking about material that's more technical in nature than, you know, maybe a magazine article or maybe a novel. So we're going to go over a number of different strategies that I think will help you to read this kind of material faster. Um, obviously, this uh, webinar is part of a series of webinars that we do. Um, if you're looking for more information about the online courses that we do, you can check out our website. If you want to check out some of our live courses, we do them in a number of cities across the U.S. Um, again, you can go on our website and check that out. But I want to get right to it here. When we're talking about textbook reading, there are a number of factors that we have to take into account. For example, um, because this is more difficult material, we've got to deal with charts, diagrams, maybe maybe a formula here and there. Um, every so often, sometimes you might be going back to reread material. So I, I want to go over a number of things that are going to help you to improve your concentration while you're reading, because sometimes the textbook material that you're reading, it might not be uh, the most interesting. Now, so, for some of you, might, you might be reading textbooks that are very fascinating, but when you get to the dry material, sometimes our mind tends to wander off. So I, here's how I want you to think of speed reading. I want you to think of it as a form of productivity, a tool in your tool belt. When we train uh, readers to read faster, um, it's at the same time acknowledging that there are situations where you do need to slow down. Now with textbook reading, there are ways that you can speed up, but it's still, it's got to be within the realm of reason. You're not going to go, you know, 10,000 words per minute through textbook material. It's just too difficult. Um, if you're wondering what the average reading speed is, if you don't already know, the average person reads about 200 words a minute, but that's a measure that's based on medium level material you know, reading, you know, simpler material than textbooks. If you take the average reading speed for textbook material, it's definitely less than 200 words a minute. But if you can read textbook material at 300, 400, 500 words a minute, you're definitely in the top 1% of readers. And that's something that we try to get our readers to do. So we're going to go over a number of strategies today. And again, when I talk about speed reading and productivity, I want you to think about how reading is a an act of productivity. And you want to make sure you're, um, keeping certain principles of productivity in mind, such as, you know, try to avoid multitasking. Um, here on the screen, you see a good example of multitasking where, you know, you have uh, one person doing a number of things at a time. And if you think about um, multitasking, some people think they're good multitaskers. Well, just because you're multitasking doesn't mean you're getting a lot done. So when you're reading, one of the things you want to make sure is that you're focused solely on the act of reading. Some people are trying to read while um, maybe keeping their phone on and answering text messages or um, other ways of multitasking. So make sure you're single tasking. Another thing we need to avoid is obviously procrastination. Um, but these are things that are all involved in productivity. Now, think about the situations where your mind tends to wander off. I want to talk about some easy ways that you can start improving your concentration while you're reading. Because guess what? If you're going to be able to, if you can focus better through your material, your reading speed is going to go up, and also your comprehension is going to be better if you can learn how to concentrate. And the simplest way that you can concentrate better while reading is to use your finger or your hand as a guide. Or if you want, you can use a pen. But the idea is that you're using your pen or your hand as a guide through the text, moving from left to right, line by line. This is the simplest thing you can do starting today to start improving your concentration. And some people, one of the things they do is once they start using their hand as a guide, they notice an instant boost in their reading speed. Typically, you'll see anywhere from 20 to 30 percent uh, faster. And you might want to measure this on your own. Try reading without your hand for a minute and calculate your speed, and then try reading with your hand for a minute and calculate your speed. And with practice, one of the things that you'll notice is the more you use your hand as a guide, the better you're going to improve your focus while you're reading. Now, I know this isn't practical if you're reading on the computer screen. For example, who wants to drag their finger across the screen while reading? Um, that is not very practical. And if you do a lot of reading, let's say your textbook is on, you know, on, you have to read your textbook, a chapter, and let's say maybe it's a PDF. For that kind of reading, if you're reading digitally, uh, one of the things that we recommend is an application that we developed. And this is a speed reading application that is free to use. It's called Accelerator. And it's, av it's available at Accelerator.com. And I want to show you really quickly how this application works. You go to Accelerator.com, and it looks very simple, just like this. 
And this area right here is where you would paste your text from the material that you want to read. So let's take some very technical material from the onion. And let's say we want to read this article here. World scientists admit they just don't like mice. What you can do is you highlight the material that you want to read, like so, and then you copy that material. And then you go back to the Accelerator application and you paste your material in here. Once you paste the material, all you got to do is hit begin. And there are some settings here. This is where you can determine how fast you want to read. Right now it's set at 300 words a minute. That's the default. So notice that's a little above average. The average reading speed, remember, is around 200 words a minute. Let's see if you could read this article at 300 words a minute. And again, this article is World Scientists Admit They Just Don't Like Mice. Let's try it out at 300 words a minute. You're going to notice the words are going to be blinking on the screen right in the middle here. Let's see if you can uh, read this material and comprehend it. Here we go. All right, let me stop it there. You guys get the idea. Um, and in the settings, you also know that this was blinking two words at a time as we're going along. You can change that in the settings. If you just wanted to go one word at a time, if you wanted to do two or three, you can change it here. One of the things I recommend is you start with two because you're more than capable of, once you're fluent in a language, you're more than capable of reading more than one word at a time. And there's a number of other settings here. We're not gonna go into, you can explore this application more on your own. There's a number of advanced settings here. But I think if you have digital material, remember we were talking about using your hand as a guide. This is useful if the material is printed out, it's a textbook, it's physically in front of you, you know, with pages. But if you have material that's on the computer screen, well, then you might wanna, resort to using an application like Accelerator. And in either situation, whether you're using Accelerator or if you're using your hand as a guide, you are pacing yourself. Think about the idea of pacing yourself. This, the way you're pacing yourself with Accelerator is you're changing the settings to a pace that you wanna go at. Maybe you wanna go 350, or maybe you wanna go 417 words per minute. Whatever speed you wanna go, you're pacing yourself through this application. Now, when you're reading on the printed page, you can pace yourself in a similar kind of manner, but using your hand as a guide. Now, another reason why using your hand as a guide is important is because your eyes are naturally attracted to motion. And because your eyes are naturally attracted to motion, it's going to improve your focus as you're reading on the printed page. And if you're not reading on the printed page, use Accelerator and that will blink the words and that'll improve your focus because you're only looking in one area of the screen while reading. So check out that application when you get a chance. Um, now, what about situations where you just don't have time to read? I wanna discuss this because a lot of students, they'll get into situations where, you know, maybe they procrastinate a little bit and now there's so much reading that they haven't done and they need to get as much of it done as possible by tomorrow. And there are certain situations where it's just not possible to read everything by tomorrow. And I want you to think back to, you know, in high school, when you didn't read the novel, what did you do? You would go to maybe sparknotes.com or you would check out the clip notes and you would read summaries on that particular, that particular uh, novel. Now, what about material that is online? If you have digital material, let's say you have a PDF, a report that you have to read by tomorrow, um, there's an application that we developed that helps you summarize text. So the idea is very similar to Cliff Notes or Spark Notes, but the idea is taking text and with the click of a button, summarizing it. So we've developed this application called Summarize This. This is also a free application. I think you'll find it very useful. And it works very similarly to uh, Accelerator. You paste text in the box that you have there, and then it will generate the summary when you click the Summarize button. Again, this is again, all on the topic of reading digitally. Obviously, um, this doesn't work so well if you have physical text because you can't copy and paste it in there. But if you have text that is you know, online, on the screen, copy and pasting it into this application will give you a nice summary. And again, this is more so useful if you run into situations where 
You've got, you don't have time to read the material, but you need a summary of this section or a summary of this chapter. This application works really well with nonfiction, informational material. So check it out when you get a chance, absolutely free. I think you'll find it very useful. Let's move back into digital. Um, when we're not re reading digital material, but printed material, I want to talk about a strategy that will, it's a speed reading strategy, but you can apply it to reading textbook material. And this is called the deadline technique or the deadline strategy. Works very, it's very easy to implement. All you do is you measure how long does it take you to read exactly one page of text. And then you try to meet or beat that time. So let's say it took you a minute and 10 seconds to read one page of text. For all similar pages in that textbook, you would try to beat that minute 10 mark. Or you might want to challenge yourself and say, let me see if I could do it in just one minute flat. But the idea is that you're using a deadline, such as a minute and 10 seconds, to improve your focus. And one of the things that you'll find is when you do set deadlines, you will improve your ability to concentrate because you're constantly trying to beat that particular deadline. So your focus shifts to trying to be more efficient. So this kind of a deadline strategy is very useful. And of course, you could do it, you could try it out on one page, or if you feel like that's too um, too tedious, you can try doing two pages. How long does it take you to read two pages of text and try to meet or beat that time? Now, at the same time, I realize that in a lot of textbooks, you don't always have pages that are uniform. There, sometimes you have pages that are full of text. Sometimes you have pages that have diagrams and charts. But this will give you an approximation of how much time it should take you to finish one page of text. And guess what? The more you practice this particular exercise, the faster you start getting. So for example, if it took you a minute and 10 seconds originally to read one page of text, soon with practice, you'll start doing it in a minute and five seconds. And then you try to beat that, and then you'll start doing it in a minute and then a little bit less time. So you're constantly trying to optimize your reading speed. And it's very important to measure these kind of things because they make you a more efficient reader. If you know how much time it'll take you to read exactly one page of text, guess what? Now you can estimate about how much time it'll take you to read the entire chapter. If there's 30 pages of text and it's taking you about a minute per page, well, it's going to take you around 30 minutes. Or you might want to try to beat that time. So you can kind of turn this into a game. And this kind of a strategy reminds me of a very, uh, a very famous quote from Peter Drucker. He's this business management guru. And he says, what gets measured gets managed. And I would add to that, what gets measured gets managed and can also get improved. Because if you know what your time is, you know what you have to beat. And the more you apply that, the better you're going to get with your reading. Now, there is another speed reading strategy that I think will help you out. And this has to do with adjusting your reading speed. Think about when you're driving a car. You don't always drive the same speed. You know what? You shouldn't always read at the same speed. So here is a very simple strategy that will help you with comprehension, and this will also help you out with speed. You adjust your reading speed. Here's a good rule of thumb. You slow down on the first sentence of a paragraph, and then you speed up a little bit after that first sentence. So why would we slow down on the first sentence of a paragraph? It's probably pretty obvious to you. The first sentence tends to be the main idea. Now, we know it's not always the case, but most of the time it is. The first sentence is usually the main idea or the topic sentence. However you want to call it, the first sentence tells us, here's what I'm going to tell you in this really long paragraph. And then they're going to start giving you details. So the idea here is that you would slow down a little bit on the first sentence, and then you would speed up and try to take that main idea and run with it. Now, when I say slow down, I don't mean going extremely slow, like five words per minute. I mean going carefully. So you go carefully on the first sentence, and after that first sentence, you start speeding up a little bit. And when I say speed up, I don't mean going ridiculously fast. I mean just going a little bit faster, kind of like when you're in a car and you accelerate. You don't just, you know, put the pedal to the metal. You'll accelerate when there's no traffic. You'll decelerate when there is traffic, and you should do the same thing with your reading. Slowing down on the first sentence is a good rule of thumb, but you can adjust the strategy. If you notice that, you know, the author always puts his or her main ideas at the end of paragraphs, then you can slow down at the end of paragraphs. But the idea is the same. You're constantly shifting gears. You're slowing down, speeding up. And you could actually do this on entire paragraphs. If you're reading through a textbook and you're reading a section of material that you're very familiar with, you should have some confidence and be able to speed up a little bit through that material because maybe that was already discussed in class earlier today or last week and you remember this information very well. Or you just know this information so well that you can go a little faster. You should have that kind of confidence to speed up. Now, remember how we talked about earlier using your hand as a guide, how that was important? 
how it improves focus. Well, guess what? Using your hand or a pen to guide your eyes, this is the easiest way to speed up your reading and change up your reading speed. How do you change your reading speed when you're not using your hand or a pen to guide your eyes? You can't really, you can't really do it. It's, it's more difficult. So it's very easy. The other benefit to using your hand or a pen while you're reading is that you can very easily slow down and speed up. If you're just staring at a printed page, it's very hard to speed up or slow down. Now, by the way, that Accelerator application that I showed you earlier, the one that blinks the words on the screen, there's an advanced setting there that you can check off that will change up your reading speed. It'll keep the average words per minute the same, but it'll slow down in certain instances and it'll speed up in other situations. So again, adjusting your reading speed is the simplest way you can get better comprehension. And it's also a good way to speed up your reading. When I say speed up your reading, I know this, this particular uh, tip here talks about slowing down and then speeding up, but I want you to think about how that improves your focus. If you're going at exactly the same speed through everything, it's very easy to lose your, to kind of zone out and space out. It's kind of like uh, when you have a, if you ever had a teacher that talked in a very monotone voice throughout the class, it's very easy to fall asleep in those kind of lectures because the person doesn't change their, their pitch. And the same thing goes with reading. If you're reading at the same speed, it gets very easy to space out. And with this kind of a strategy of slowing down and speeding up, because you're constantly changing speed, it helps you focus because you're never going at the same speed. So try implementing this in your material while you're reading. And this strategy works especially well on textbook material because before they give you some really long paragraph with tons of detail, they have to tell you what they're going to tell you. And that's how most people write. First sentence is the topic sentence. Here's what I'm going to tell you. And then they start telling you. So try to implement the strategy. Now, what about dealing with diagrams, charts, formulas? This is another situation we have to get to when we're reading textbook material. And this is where we would also adjust our reading speed. By that, I mean, you think, again, think back to when you're driving a car. There are situations where you have to completely stop the car. And there are situations in reading where you have to stop reading. And that happens when we're dealing with charts and diagrams. We have to stop reading maybe the paragraph. And we've got to analyze some kind of a chart or diagram. And this can sometimes be a little difficult, especially in textbook material, when you're presented with very, very complex diagrams. How do we deal with that kind of information? Now, let's think about how most people deal with it. A lot of times there's a diagram on one page and there's text on the other page and someone's reading along and at some situation they stop reading and they look at the diagram and they're completely confused by what's going on here. Part of it is because this is very complex, but part of it is also because they're not reading correctly. The best way to handle diagrams or charts or formulas is like this. While you're reading, the moment there's gonna be a situation where it tells you refer to figure 2.4. The moment that it tells you that, you should stop reading and refer to 2.4. Now, I know that sounds obvious, but a lot of people don't read this way. A lot of people, they're reading and it says, refer to figure 2.4, and they think to themselves, yeah, 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 and they keep on reading through the material. You should stop at that point to look at the diagram for a first impression. So in this situation, I see a number of different colored lines. I see a lot of complexity here. I'm not trying to figure it out, but I would leave my hand wherever I stopped reading. And now I continue reading beyond that first sentence, which was maybe refer to figure 2.4. At this point, they might tell me figure 2.4 shows the relationship between blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. At that point, I would stop reading and I would look to see if that's true. So they told me there's this relationship going on. I want to see that visually for myself. The moment that I see that, Think about how much my comprehension has benefited by seeing the information visually. You ever hear the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words? Well, think about how your comprehension is aided when you read a sentence, you get a little bit of comprehension, but then when you see this happening on the diagram, that benefits your comprehension tremendously. So you read that little factoid, you see it in the diagram, and then you go back to reading. So the next sentence might say something like, additionally, figure 2.4 also shows blah, 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 blah. I'll stop reading at that point to see visually, can I confirm that? And then I'll read the next sentence. It might say, you know, the green line shows blah, 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 blah. I'll stop reading and I'll follow to see, does the green line actually show that? So I know this is kind of a choppy way of reading where you're reading a sentence and then looking at the diagram, reading another sentence, looking at the diagram. But this choppy way of reading helps you understand and interpret diagrams a lot better than if you just read this entire chunk of text. 
and then try to figure out what's going on here. So again, this goes back to our strategy of adjusting our reading speed. You shouldn't always read the same at the same speed. There are situations where you need to stop and actually analyze. So read a sentence, visually confirm it. Read another sentence, visually confirm it. And when they stop talking about the diagram, you don't have to do this choppy way of reading anymore. You can just continue reading fluidly. Now, there are other situations where you might need to stop. I know some people ask me about how do I deal with footnotes? And footnotes are kind of a, um, you know, it depends kind of scenario. Sometimes you have footnotes that look like this, where they're sorting, you know, talking about other sources. And then sometimes you have footnotes that kind of expand on text. Of course, this is just filler text right here. But sometimes you have footnotes that are paragraphs in and of themselves. And whether or not you read them is dependent on your purpose. If you know, need to know the information inside out, you should definitely be reading footnotes. But if you don't need to, you can usually skip them. However, the way that you would deal with footnotes, if this footnote is at the end of the paragraph, that would be the point where I refer to the footnote. Sometimes the footnotes are in the middle of a paragraph. If that happens and you're going to read, if you plan on reading footnotes, I would stop reading at that footnote. I'd leave my finger there so I know where to pick up. And then I would read the footnote to kind of get a little more detail on that statement they just made. And then I would continue on from there. But that's only a situation if you have to read your footnotes. And again, that's kind of dependent on a scenario by scenario basis. Let's talk about other situations where we have to stop reading while we're reading a textbook material. Occasionally, you're going to have to take notes, right? And there is a note-taking problem. And when I say a note-taking problem, what I mean by that is sometimes people take spend too much time taking notes, but it's also a problem if you don't spend any time taking notes. So the note-taking problem is kind of like a balancing problem. How much time should I spend taking notes? When should I take those notes? How should I take those notes? So let's talk about some scenarios. First of all, when should I take notes? Well, when you should take notes, I would wait until I finish a paragraph before taking any notes. So if I'm reading something and there's some kind of a important detail that's mentioned and I want to take notes, I would wait until I finish the paragraph first, just, to, just so I don't break up the flow of reading, and then I'll actually take some notes. So taking notes paragraph by paragraph can be useful, or sometimes I'll wait until I finish the entire section before taking notes. But another important question to think about is, how should I go about taking notes? There's a variety of ways, you know, from highlighting to, you know, diagramming. There's all sorts of ways that you can take notes. One way I want to show you is how to not take notes. Um, I remember throughout high school, I would have notes that just looked like this, a total mess. And when I say a total mess, um, you know, I could still read the notes, but they weren't organized in any kind of a fashion. Sometimes I would look at my notes and I would just get overwhelmed because there was so much detail there. And sometimes I would just find them useless. Well, I want to give you some alternative ways that you can take notes, and you can pick the one that works best for you. There is no single way to take notes that is best for everyone, but I want to give you some options here. One option is mind mapping. Some of you might already be familiar with mind mapping, but if you're not, mind mapping, the reason why they call it mind mapping is because it reflects the way your mind works a little more accurately than linear-based notes like this. Your mind works a little more like this, where a mind map has a central idea, and out of that come, you know, the big concepts. So you can think of this as maybe the title of the chapter in the middle. And these over here might be the headings, and anything beyond that are maybe subheadings. So mind mapping is a very visual way to take notes, and it's a nonlinear way of taking notes. And when I say nonlinear, I mean, you know, linear would be something like outlines. Now, outlines are, are great for linear information. But outlines don't work very well for a lot of information because not most information is actually nonlinear. When I say most information, I mean, let's take the topic of physics. How do we put physics into a, an outline? What should come first? Well, it's kind of hard to say because there's a lot of things involved in physics. Physics is more, you can think of it more like a mind map where you put physics in the middle here. And we could talk about Einstein's theories of relativity. We could also talk about Isaac Newton and laws of motion. We could talk about thermodynamics. There's also you know, quantum mechanics. We could talk about string theory. There's all these areas all involved in one topic, physics. And the same thing goes for other things like law. You could have the topic of law, but it doesn't necessarily fo follow an outline format. There's a lot of things involved in law. We could talk about constitutional law. There's labor law. There's intellectual property law. Not in any particular order, because some things don't have a particular order. But when you do have things that are in a certain order, outlines are better for them. If things don't have to be in a certain order, 
That's where mind mapping is a little better of an option. So use outlines for things like history, sequential information. Use mind maps for nonlinear information. Now, these aren't the only two ways you can take notes. Some people take notes by taking notes in the margins of the page. And this can be a, an effective way of summarizing paragraphs. One of the things I like to do is maybe put a word or two or a short phrase next to the paragraph. And when I look back at that short phrase, it'll remind me what that paragraph was about. And I want you to remember that you don't need to highlight entire sentences or paragraphs. Sometimes just writing a word or a phrase will remind you of what this paragraph is about. For example, when I say the word Katrina, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? For a lot of people, it would be a hurricane because they associate the word Katrina with the word hurricane. Now, if you had a significant other that's name was Katrina or a, or a sister that's named was Katrina, you would think you would associate that with the word Katrina. But we don't need you know, entire sentences to give us, you know, the whole meaning. Sometimes we just need a word and that'll remind us of what this paragraph is about. So that's when taking notes in the margin can be helpful. Now, what about highlighting? Because I do, I do know that some of you are probably spending your time highlighting and let's talk about highlighting. There's nothing wrong with highlighting, but there are good and bad forms of highlighting. If you look at the right, this is what some uh, used college textbooks end up looking like. Now, the good is over here. Remember how I said just a word or a short phrase will sometimes remind you of what that paragraph was about? This is a useful way to highlight. And obviously, if you're highlighting like this, that kind of dilutes the importance of highlighting. So make sure that when you're highlighting, remember when I, earlier I said, when should you take notes? Probably when you finish a paragraph. Because how does excessive highlighting happen? I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you how something like this ends up happening. Someone's reading through this material and they need to know it really well. They want to soak up all the information. Maybe they have a test tomorrow and they need to know it inside out. So they read a sentence and they're like, you know what? That's kind of important. I'm going to highlight that. They pick up their highlighter and they highlight. And then they read the next sentence. And it turns out that next sentence is pretty important too. So they highlight that one as well. Now they read the third sentence. And it turns out this sentence is way more important than the previous two, so they've got to highlight that as well. Um, maybe they might use a different color at this point, but you already see where this is going. You ever hear this expression, when you get caught up in the details, you lose sight of the big picture? This is exactly what's happening when someone is highlighting like this. They're, they're reading sentence by sentence instead of paragraph by paragraph or section by section. What I suggest you do is if you have the urge to highlight or take notes of any kind, wait until you finish a paragraph at least and then make your highlight or make your note. Don't take notes in the middle of a paragraph because that breaks up the flow of reading. It breaks up your concentration. And also, you don't know if you might encounter something more important later in that paragraph. So make sure that you're not taking notes too often. And if you're wondering what a good balance of note-taking is, take 100% of the time that you're spending uh, studying. And 80% of that time, at least 80% of that time, should be spent reading. 20% of that time at most should be spent taking notes. And I know a lot of people that will spend almost like 50-50, 50% of their time reading, 50% of their time taking notes. And that's kind of a, that's a, that's too much note taking. If you're trying, and, and plus it's going to take you forever to get through the chapter. So make sure that you are taking notes here and there, but not excessively. Now, why do we take notes? Well, note taking actually helps us remember. It turns out that uh, when you write something down, just the action of writing something down helps you remember the material, even if you never look at it again. Why is that? Because repetition helps you remember. I'll repeat that. Repetition helps you remember things. This is how songs get stuck in our head. You don't hear a song once and automatically memorize the lyrics. To, to memorize a song, you need to hear that song over and over again, and that repetition is what makes it sticky. That repetition helps it get stuck in your head. I'll bet there's probably some song I could turn on right now that you haven't heard in years, and you'll be able to recite or sing along with the song because you've heard that so many times that repetition helps the information get stuck in your head. So remember that note-taking is a form of repetition, and... For some people that read through a chapter, a textbook chapter, and they get to the end and they can't remember anything, sometimes it's because they weren't taking enough notes. So again, I know you don't want to spend too much time taking notes, but you don't want to avoid taking notes because note-taking will help you remember because it is a form of repetition. Now, what are some other ways that we can get repetition in to help improve our ability to retain the information? One thing that you can do 
is something called the read and recall strategy. The read and recall strategy is, it works very simply. You read a paragraph and then you quickly take a note, maybe a keyword or a phrase, and then you just repeat. So after every paragraph, you're taking a quick note on what that paragraph was about. Now, the quick note is meant just to simply get you through the thought process of what did I just read? So after you finish every single paragraph, you want to get into this mindset of thinking, what did I just read? What did I just read? And when you're taking those notes, you want to make sure that you're just writing down maybe a keyword or a phrase and however you're going to take notes, you can write the note next to the paragraph or you could write the note on a separate sheet of paper. This kind of a, an exercise is a way to improve your ability to retain information. I'm not suggesting that you do this indefinitely for the rest of your life on every single paragraph. But if you're trying to improve your ability to retain information, this is a good exercise to do maybe 15 minutes a day for two weeks. And one of the things that you'll find by doing this, you'll start getting better at recalling what you read because you'll always be in that mindset. You've trained yourself to get into the mindset of, what did I just read? What did I just read? And that also improves your focus because if you're constantly asking yourself after every paragraph, what did I just read? You're constantly keeping your focus in that material and it's going to be harder for you to space out. So try doing this exercise 15 minutes a day for two weeks. And by the way, when I say read a paragraph, I do understand that sometimes you get to paragraphs that are just one or two sentences long. The paragraph is really short. You don't have to do that because that'll make it a little tedious. But anytime you come across those bigger paragraphs, read the paragraph and immediately write down something at the end of that paragraph by asking yourself, what did I just read? And write down maybe a keyword or a phrase that kind of sums up or something that you remember from that material. Now, how, how about dealing with technical terms? Because one of the problems that we have when we're reading through textbook materials, occasionally we're going to come across new vocabulary. We're going to have to deal with technical information. And here's the thing about human memory. We're really good at remembering visual information. We are really bad at remembering abstract information. So let, let me explain to you what I mean by visual versus abstract. Visual information, this uh, picture is easy to remember. But a technical term like the one you see on your screen is a little harder to remember because that's abstract information. We, we can't easily picture that information. So again, something like this, very easy to picture because it is a picture and something like this, a little, a little more, uh, it's harder to picture this. Now, what if I said the word bread? If I said the word bread, you can visually picture that information, but I want to talk about a strategy for reading and dealing with technical terms because this idea of abstract information uh, versus visual reminds me of something called the Baker Baker paradox, which is really interesting. And it has to do with human memory. There were two situations where they told one group of people that a person's name was Mr. Baker, and they wanted to see how many people would remember this person's name the next day. And they found that 90% of the people forgot this person's name the next day. Now, they took another group of people, and they told these people not that the person's name was Mr. Baker, but instead that this person was a baker, that that was his profession. Now, the next day they asked these people, that were introduced to the baker, the baker by profession, and they asked them, do you remember what this person does for a living? And 90% of them were able to remember that this person was a baker. Now think about it. The, this is why they call it the baker-baker paradox is because we have the same word, baker, in two different contexts. But in one context, the name, it's easy to forget. We've all forgotten names before. But in another context, it's very easy to remember. Why? Because when you're thinking of a baker, the occupation, a lot more things are going on in your brain. You're making a lot more connections. For example, when I say baker, the occupation of a baker, what do you first picture? You start visualizing what a baker might look like. Maybe you're picturing a top hat or maybe an apron. I'm, I'm thinking of maybe some flour on their hands. But we have a visual reference for a baker. But if the person's name is Mr. Baker, it's easily forgettable because that is abstract. So what I'm saying here is we need to take, ab whenever we're presented with abstract information, like a technical term, we need to take that abstract information and turn it into a visual, into visual information. And the best way to do this is a very cool technique called the similar sound technique. This will help you remember technical terms better. And by the way, this will be helpful if you're learning a language as well. So here's how it works. The similar sound technique tries to take similar sounds in a word, and convert them to something you can easily visualize. So think of the word salary and picture the word, picture. it sounds like celery, right? The word freedom 
hard, kind of hard to visualize, but it sounds like fried ham. Now, I know it ha fried ham has nothing to do with freedom, but same thing here. Happiness sounds like happy nest. Now, let's go over, and by the way, this can work with acronyms as well if you have to memorize acronyms. K-A-G sounds like cage. R-O-X sounds like rocks, and so on and so forth. How do we apply this terminology? Let me give you some examples. Here's how we could use a similar sound technique on a word like claustrophobia. Now, you probably already know the definition of claustrophobia. But let's say we were trying to teach this to maybe a younger brother or sister that we have, or a son or daughter that we have. What we would do is we take a similar sound in this word, the word, the sound clause. See that right there? A little kid might be familiar with the word clause because they associate that to what? Cluster, uh, to uh, Santa Claus, right? So here's how we use a similar sound technique. We would take that similar sound, clause, and we already know what phobia means, the fear of, and we would come up with some kind of a visualization and think about it like this. I want you to visualize and imagine that Santa Claus has a fear of tight chimney spaces. Why? Because, you know, Santa Claus is a big guy and he's fearful of these small, tight chimneys. So we know that claustrophobia is the fear of like closed spaces. Well, we can associate in a little kid's mind, we can associate Claus, the similar sound, Santa Claus, and explain to them that Santa Claus has a fear of tight chimneys. So the next time they see the word claustrophobia, they would all, all they would have to remember was this similar sound, clause, and that should remind them that Santa Claus has a fear of closed spaces, the tight chimneys, and they'll remember the definition. Now, you already know the definition of claustrophobia, so I want to give you a different example, maybe a phobia that you probably don't know. Here's a phobia, balloon phobia. Now, most people don't know what this phobia is because it's not as common as claustrophobia, but I'm going to teach you how you can use the similar sound technique to remember what this word means. Now, I don't want you Googling what this word means right now. This word is the fear of needles. Here's how you're going to learn through the similar sound technique what this means. We look for a similar sound. So let's take the word balone because we already know what phobia means. So balone, to me, that kind of sounds like balloon. So I want you to imagine that the balloon is afraid of needles. Why? Because a balloon can get popped by needles. Now, the visualization of a balloon being afraid. Now, I know that balloons are inanimate objects and they don't have the capacity for emotion. But I want you to imagine a cartoon-like balloon that is absolutely fearful, just panicking from this needle that is approaching it. So. Later on, when you're presented with this word, balloon phobia, all you got to do is look for a similar sound. And earlier, you'll remember, oh yeah, balloon, that sounds like balloon. What does that remind me of? And if you were visualizing in your head that a balloon was afraid of this needle coming at it, you would remember this is the fear of needles. Um, hopefully that wouldn't remind you of the fear of balloons, which is, it would be really, I, I wonder if there's a phobia for that. But the idea here is that we're linking a visual with a similar sound and trying to remember the meaning of the word. So the similar sound here is balloon, similar sound to balloon. We visualize that a balloon is afraid of needles, and that is going to link the definition in our mind that this is the fear of needles. Now I'll give you another example here. Let's take anthrophobia. Anthrophobia. Well, this is actually the fear of people. Now, one of the things that you can do here is we try to take a word that we're already familiar with there. Let's take uh, ant. The ant is afraid of people stepping on it. Where do we get this from? Well, we take this part right here, not anthro. Now you might know that anthro means, you know, anthropology. You might link that to anthropology, but you could also link A-N-T with ant, ant being the insect. And we, since we need to connect this similar sound, ant, to the definition, we would take our right, ant. What would an ant be afraid of? The ant is afraid of people stepping on it. So later on, when you're presented with this word, the only thing you can remember is that you're looking for a similar sound. And you would find that similar sound here, ant. And you would remember, oh yeah, ant. The ant was afraid of people stepping on it. And that'll remind you, this is the definition, the ant, the fear of people. So use a similar sound technique to remember technical terms. And by the way, you could use this for uh, new languages that you might be learning. All you do is, whatever the word is in a new language, try to link it, whatever it sounds like, in a language you're already familiar with. 
and then try to create some kind of a visualization. Why? Because we already talked about this earlier. Visual information is easier to remember than abstract information. So when you have an abstract term, a technical term that you need to remember, you need to somehow turn it into a visualization, and you can do that using that similar sound technique. So let's talk about what do we do when we're done reading. When I, by that I mean um, situations where we get to maybe the end of a section, and sometimes we, we can't remember what we just read. You ever have that situation where you read a whole page of text and you look up like, what did I just read? What I have no clue what I just read. Well, this is where you want to try rereading kind of strategically. So one way you can improve your concentration, we already talked about it, use your hand as a guide. But sometimes we, we just space out. Sometimes we've got other things on our mind. So I want to introduce you to a concept uh, that we, we call it rereading strategically. So there are situations where you, you need to reread because maybe you lost focus. But there are other, other situations where you're rereading maybe because the information is very technical and it's very difficult to understand. So one of the things that I like to do while I'm reading, very technical information, if I'm reading through the paragraph and I'm having a hard time understanding it fully, at the end of the paragraph, I'll put a little mark next to the paragraph. Now, what that mark means is when I get to the end of the section or when I get to the end of the chapter, I'm going to go back and reread that that particular paragraph. Why? Because while I was reading it, I, I don't feel like I was understanding it fully. My confidence level wasn't that high reading through that paragraph. So while you're reading through, make sure that you have a, a pen nearby and you could just put a little mark next to each paragraph that you feel like is, that, that you don't have perfect comprehension. And what'll happen is when you get to the end of a, a chapter or the end of a section and you go back to reread that paragraph, nine times out of 10, you'll find that it's so much easier to understand because you can read it now in the context of the entire chapter. So when I'm reading very technical information like a textbook, I just put marks next to any paragraphs that are where, where I read through them and I feel like my comprehension was so-so. And the reason why I'm putting those marks is because I'm trying to continuously make progress through this chapter. I don't want to reread this paragraph three times in a row because sometimes I could reread that paragraph later and it'll make a lot more sense because I understand it in the context of the chapter. Now, there are some other situations we need to discuss when we're talking about textbook material. Textbook chapters can sometimes be very, very long. And what do you do if you have to read a number of chapters and you have to read for long periods of time? Maybe you've got to do two, three, four, five or more hours of reading. How should you approach really long periods of time reading? Here's a strategy I think you'll find very useful. It's called the 25-5 strategy. What happens is you read for 25 minutes and then you break for five minutes. Or when I say break, some people think, you know, you don't have to take a break. You could actually take notes during that five minutes, but you stop reading for five minutes is what I mean. So, and then you just repeat, read for 25 minutes, take a break for five minutes. Now, while you're reading for 25 minutes, you want to make sure that you have very strong concentration by just focusing on one task. So one of the things that I like to do is I will actually turn my phone off during that 25 minutes. Now, I know some people go through withdrawal by, by having their phone off, or they think, what if something really important comes up? But usually it's just a text message or something that comes in to distract you. So um, if you're fearful that you might miss something, that's the whole point of a, a break for five minutes. So I'll turn my phone off for 25 minutes, and then during my break, I'll check my phone. Or if your phone takes a long time to start up and shut down, what I do is I just put my phone on uh, airplane mode for 25 minutes, and then I take it off airplane mode, check if there's any messages that came in. Or if you don't want to do that, you can just take notes, and this is a good way to get through lots of reading. Now, why, you're probably wondering, why, why 25 minutes? This is actually based on some research that deals with human productivity and human focus. How long can someone focus on a task before their concentration gets thrown off. And what they find is it takes about 25 minutes. After 25 minutes, that's kind of our breaking point for most people. It gets very difficult to concentrate on a task for more than 25 minutes at a time. Some of you already know this. Some of you, it might be maybe less than 25 minutes before you start losing focus. But they find this is kind of like the maximum for a lot of people. So if you're reading and you have to read for an hour and a half, it's not a good idea to just read for an hour and a half nonstop. So if you're going if you're going to read for an hour and a half, try reading for 25 minutes and then use 5 minutes of note taking. 
and or reviewing your notes, and then another 25 minutes of reading, and then five minutes of note taking, and, and you repeat this process. And that break right there, that actually gives your brain some much needed rest. And it actually allows your brain to work on other matters. If you're taking notes, you're using a different part of your brain than when you're reading. So this is a good strategy to use and implement if you have to read for long periods of time. And one of the things you'll find is that you can maintain a higher reading speed if you're reading in this way than if you just try reading for two hours straight. Now, what about when you're done reading? What do we do after we finish a chapter? Now, some people, they finish a chapter and they just close the book right away. But if you need to know your textbook chapter really well, there are a few quick things you can do at the end of a chapter that will improve your comprehension, that will improve your retention of the material as well. So one thing you can do is reread any sections you didn't understand. Remember earlier I talked about making notes or little marks next to paragraphs that you feel were very technical, that were hard to understand? At this point, if you're done with a chapter, you go back and reread those sections, those, those paragraphs, and usually you'll find they're easier to understand. Another thing you can do when you're done reading is to reread headings, subheadings, or boldface words. This is kind of like a review. So you're done with the chapter. To go through 20, 30, or 40 pages of headings and subheadings usually doesn't take that long. You just flip through, you're looking at those headings and subheadings, and it gives you a nice review of the material. And if you find anything that you feel like you need a little more clarity on, all you have to do is reread that section. But that's a good way, and, and this is a very quick thing that you can do if you're just looking at the headings and subheadings. Now you can also think about if you need to memorize anything, the time to do it is at the end of the chapter. Don't try memorizing memorizing something in the middle of your reading, in the middle of a chapter. If you need to memorize anything, save it for when you're done with the chapter. And in terms of memory techniques, um, there's all sorts of memory techniques. We actually have an entire memory course that you can check out on our website. Um, it's an online course that we have. Um, we don't have time to get into those details, but one type of memorization technique is the similar sound technique that we talked about earlier. Speaking of which, do you remember what these words mean? And if we executed this similar sound technique effectively, you probably remember what this word means, right? Balloon phobia, because you take a similar sound, balloon, sounds like balloon, and what does that remind you of? What was the balloon afraid of? Or the word anthrophobia. We take a similar sound, ant. And what was the ant afraid of? And if you remember these things correctly, you'll remember that balloon phobia was the fear of needles, anthrophobia was the fear of people. And if you were able to remember that, congratulations. That, that's using the similar sound technique to your advantage. Now, if you are uh, interested in more instruction. We actually have live in-person courses. If you want to invite us to your school or, school or campus, we'd be happy to be there. I know uh, we do a number of these webinars. We're going we're gonna to try to do them on a monthly basis. So um, if you signed up for this webinar, we'll keep you posted on future webinars that are free. Um, if you want to attend one of our live courses, um, check out our website or invite us to your, to your school or campus. You can get in touch with me directly if you'd like to. Um, we actually have courses that are available in a few select cities throughout the U.S., um, if you are in any of the following cities, we actually have courses scheduled right now in the coming months. So you can go check out our schedule at irisreading.com. Click on the live courses link on our website, and it'll show you the entire schedule for all the cities. If we're not yet in, our, in your particular city, again, if you want to reach out and invite us to your school or your organization, um, we'll try to organize something there. And for a limited time, you can get $100 off our public courses that are in the following cities. Now, if you like learning online, which is very convenient because you could take these courses whenever, um, you can check out some of our online courses. We have a number of courses. The Speed Reading Foundation course, this is useful if you are just getting started with speed reading and you're trying to boost your general reading speed. This is a very good starting point. Um, if you already are familiar with the basics of speed reading and you want to kind of master it, we have a speed reading mastery course. If you feel like you're already a fast reader but you need help with comprehension, there's a comprehension course. There's also a, a comprehension and a memory improvement course. We also have a mind mapping course if you're interested in that particular topic. A productivity course which is geared a little more towards uh, working professionals, people that are trying to get the most out of their day. And we also have a course to help you improve your concentration. These are all online courses and you can get them on our website um, at a discount if you're interested. I want to thank you all for attending the webinar. Um, if you have any additional questions, 
please send me an email and I'll try to get back to your question as soon as I can. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, feel free to do so. But I want to thank you guys for coming out and showing your support. Uh, for this program. We're trying to get it into as many cities as possible. And we're really trying to help people with their reading because think about this. When was the last time you learned how to read? It was a while ago, right? And th the problem is a lot of people learn how to read once in their life and they never learn better ways for reading maybe magazines or textbooks or you know maybe novels. So that's one of the things we're trying to do here at Iris. So if you found something helpful, uh, please tell your friends about it. Um, we have a question coming in right now if the PowerPoint presentation will be available. We actually, for those that registered for this webinar, you will get an email um, by tomorrow, within 24 hours of this webinar's completion, you'll get an email with a link to this particular, uh, this webinar, and you'll also get a link to the presentation slides. So I want to thank you all for coming out again, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a great day.